You're on mute. <laughs> that should be good. Okay. Is that better? Oh, wow. <laughs> You're your uh traffic going out of style. <laughs> <laughs> no, yeah, your good. internet connection seems to be very slow. We we can we can barely understand you. <laughs> Frank, maybe you can try joining on your phone. Do you think that would work better? Yeah, maybe switch to phone audio. I'm going to switch computers to the network. Yeah. All right. We'll, we'll, we'll wait a couple of minutes for you. All right. Let's see. So the last time I checked, we had 41 people register for this uh, as attendees, and I see 20 here right now. So I think we'll wait a couple more minutes, hopefully get through the technology issues and give people a few minutes to show up, and then we'll get started. Not letting me on my phone either. So if you um, click on the little up arrow by the by the mute button, there's something. There should be an option to switch to phone audio. Okay, I just did that. And then you and then it'll show you the phone numbers that you can dial in from the meeting ID and your participant ID. Test, test, can you hear me now? Yeah, it's still... Uh, it, it's still really choppy. Yeah. 
it's like a You might try turning off your video and ju just try an audio. Okay. Anything better there? Yes. My video's much, off. Much better. Okay. All right. I'm sorry about that. I'd like to look at people, but it is what it is. Yeah. Well, sometimes the internet just doesn't want to give you the bandwidth that you need. Um, wow. All right, so uh, let's go ahead and get started. So um, I'm Gregory Schneider, I'm the board president, uh, joined today by Frank Marizio, our executive director, and uh, Danielle Martinez, another board member, and Christy, and Christy Martin, a teacher in our high school. So the purpose of today is truly just an open town hall. Um, some people send in questions ahead of time, and we'll try and address those. Uh, I think we'll kind of go back and forth between questions that were submitted ahead of time and people who'd like to ask them live. Um, and the way that is gonna work is there should be an option on your Zoom uh, to raise your hand. Uh, if you click that, then I'll know that you have a question and you'd like to talk, and then I can allow you to talk um, and you can ask your question live and we'll answer it live. So uh, I'm imagining this is going to be a true back and forth discussion. Um, feel free to ask whatever you'd like. Um, if we can, if it's not confidential information, um, we will share it. There's some limits to what we can talk about publicly, but um, the, the nice thing about today is we're not constrained by the open meeting laws uh, because there are only two board members present, uh, which is less than a quorum. So um, let's uh, let's start off with a live question. Um, if you if you uh, if you have a question, uh, please raise your hand, and I'll see if I can get this to work and promote you uh, to be able to speak. Huh. Deidre Egan has a question. Hi there. Thanks for taking my question. Um, I'm just was, I did miss, uh, find, uh, caught the tail end of the board meeting, so I didn't really hear any specifics um, yet about school opening. So I'm sure that that is going to be addressed. But um, just the... Um, we have such a lovely campus, a lot of outside territory. We're all distancing and masking. Um, and with that in mind, uh, wondering whether, you know, that can help us in, whether, you know, when we do open up or in encourage us to open up perhaps sooner if we are outside having beautiful weather, et cetera, et cetera. Okay. You got my question. Has it been considered um, having outdoor classes. So let me talk about that from a historical perspective. And then I think uh, Frank can address that from what's going on, you know, more immediately. So yes, we considered trying to have classes outdoors. The, 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 our huge campus is kind of a blessing and a burden in this case though, because we have so much space, it's hard to get Wi-Fi coverage across the whole space. Um, and we've struggled to get consistently reliable internet to the campus, uh, you know, of sufficient bandwidth that, that it would be, that it's good enough for everybody, for every teacher to be teaching. Um, and then the other issue with trying to have outdoor classes is that Unlike, say, a lot of private Waldorf schools that have chosen to just do their entire class outside, but stay entirely in person, in Arizona, um, as a public school, we have to offer virtual only option, too. So we can't just say, well, we're going to be all in person. We, we actually, by executive order from Governor Ducey, have to offer a virtual only option for those who are going to opt for that this school year. 
So when you combine those two things, it was extremely challenging to find an outdoor space that had everything we needed to have, a, like a classroom setting, plus have internet access of sufficient quality that the you know students could even observe, much less have the teacher also interact with them. Yes. I can understand that. I, I thought that that might be an issue. Um, <clears throat> within that, I mean, is there, I mean, you know, hot spots on phones, et cetera, some way that could um, beef up the coverage for these uncertain, you know, and unusual times? Yeah, and, and I think the, like, we figured out the internet to the classrooms thing. Um, in a, a very good way. And uh, this is where our classroom layout helps us a lot is that we have a lot of small buildings with a lot of windows in them that we can open up and have the ventilation going, uh, but then still have, you know, it's not so sunny that the teacher can still see what the virtual students are doing and interact with them. So w once we get to, so then the, then the limiting factor is we'll, you know, how do we get back to at least a hybrid model? And that right now is the board has decided we're gonna follow what DHS recommends the delivery model should be based on three benchmarks, case positivity, the number of cases per 100,000 people and the number of hospital visits. So those <clears throat> um, have been very high over the last month. Um, at one point we were the highest in the world, I think, in Maricopa County. Right, um, the, right now we are trending down uh, in a very significant way and I'm cautiously optimistic it's gonna continue in that direction, but I think you know, we're still maybe as much as a month away from getting back to hybrid based on the DHS recommendations. Thank you so much. You're welcome, thanks for asking the question. All right. Um, let me, okay, here we go. Ah, all right. Lower, lower hand, okay. So let's then swap to uh, a question we received uh, by email ahead of this from Allison Easter. Uh, so she asked, she asked the same question you did, Deidre, uh, about outdoor learning and why aren't we doing that? Uh, but her second question was, <clears throat> uh, as a parent, I noticed varying degrees of compliance with the school mask and social distancing policy, depending on the grade slash teacher. What has the school done to make sure teachers adhere to the school policies regarding the health and safety of our students and communities? How might families be assured that guidelines will be followed in the future after witnessing so many transgressions among students and staff? So, Frank, do you want to take a first stab at that one? Well, there seemed to have been some confusion from the beginning of the year mitigation plan to the mitigation plan that was updated when we went back to, um, to what we would call remote, but on-site students still coming. And... The difference was way back in the beginning before I was here, the first plan was if you were six feet apart in your class and at your desk, you didn't have to have a mask on, but that is no longer true. Now you have to have a mask on the entire time, except when you are eating at lunch. Uh, this also includes when you are being dropped off and picked up um, we are enforcing that process. Of course, every once in a while, a child forgets or takes it off and the teacher directs them to put it back on. Um, and I know I had at least one concern from a classroom and I spoke to that teacher and that has been resolved. Yeah, and that, that did change, I think, in November. Uh, or, or late, or maybe it was early December, there was another um, order, I think, that came down from the superintendent of schools that mandated 
uh, masks in classrooms and and basically anytime you're on campus with some pretty limited exceptions. All right, uh, how about another live question? Please uh, click raise your hand if you'd like to ask a question. I'm not seeing any hands. Um, all right, well, let, oh, here we go. Barb Cunningham has a question. Afternoon, Barb, welcome to the town hall. Uh, you're still on mute, it looks like. Oh, sorry, I didn't realize. I didn't realize I had control of that. Awesome. Thank you for um, doing this, guys. I really appreciate it. Hi, friends. Um, so my question is about the school contemplation that um, I think about two board meetings ago, it might have been Frank's first or second meeting. It seemed like um, he was like, yeah, let's, let's tackle this. And... And you actually, it was the meeting that you said, you know, I'd really like to get this. Um, I think it's a lofty goal to get it completed before the end of the school year, but hopefully we could have it started before winter of next year. I could be mistaken that part. The details are a little fuzzy, but mm. then I remember that it seemed like Mr. Maurizio was like, yeah, let's do it. And then we can see what it's about and people could have some time to, to ponder, you know, what the community is, is feeling. And then we can come back to it after spring. And um, I was really excited because I was thinking, wow, this might really get some traction. And, um, and I just really, I don't know, after the last meeting and, and you said, well, I haven't, uh, I was excited to hear that Frank had taught or that something had moved on, on the people that he was calling. And I was kind of disappointed. I know you have a lot to do and you have a real job, <laughs> but I did find myself feeling a little disappointed that you hadn't uh, made any contact yet. And I just, um, I just, do you feel like, um, this is something that you would like to tackle sooner than later. I guess that's my question for you. Yeah. And, and thanks for asking that question. Um, so I have some good news for you on that too. Um, so yes, there was kind of a lag time, um, but uh, I think we've made some headway in terms of getting some people involved um, so I, I don't know if you were able to make our, make our last board meeting, uh, but Liz Bevin was there, who's the president of the um, Alliance for Public Boulder. I, yeah, yes, I was there. It was wonderful. I loved it. Continue. Yeah. Thank you. Yes. And, and so she's agreed to participate in this process. Um, Frank has met with uh, Peter Rennick, who I think is in attendance today. Um, and... Joan Treadaway, um, and, and I'll let Frank talk about that meeting, but then I, I think they have a couple more meetings scheduled, um, and then I'm planning to meet with them too. And uh, when Frank and I touched base yesterday, um, we both kind of agreed, you know, wouldn't it be great if we could do this the week after school ends, when people have a little bit of free, more free time, but before people go on vacation. So, so yes, we would like to move this along a little faster and try and get some alignment on what, uh, you know, answering the big questions of who are we, why are we here, you know, what, what are our values before we start a, another school year? So, Frank, do you want to? Yes, I'd, I'd love to chime in there. Yeah. Um, I had a fantastic uh, Zoom meeting with Joan and Peter, and I see Mr. Rennick is on the on the uh, participants with us. Hi, Peter. Um, it went really well. I, I believe they felt the same way. 
so much so that we've scheduled um, not just one more meeting, but we're hoping to meet more over the next couple of weeks because we've still got a lot to talk about and I've got a lot of information to gather from them. Um, it's clear that they love this, this campus and this school and uh, more than one person has described them to me as the grandparents of Desert Marigold and they laughed when I said that to them on our Zoom call. But um, we both, we, all three of us had a conversation about the contemplation, and we even talked about what the point of a contemplation is. And for those of you who may not have ever done one of these before, it's about what the word means, to think about. We're going to spend time thinking about with the three big group holders, the board, the staff, and the parents, some of the things Gregory um, mentioned, like who are we, why are we here? But I know for several parents that I've met with and for Joan and Peter, um, the question they have had to me is, how did we get where we are today with the frustrations? And I believe that that contemplation can bring us together. And I know Peter and Joan have committed to being part of it. I know um, Teresa, who has great skills as an HR conflict resolutionist has agreed to be part of it. And really the board and me are part of the entities that this is going to happen to. We are not necessarily going to be the people running it. We're going to be participants in it, just like parents and staff members. And Gregory, am I saying that correctly? No, I think that's entirely true. You know, we're all stakeholders here and we're bringing in the outside experts because that's exactly what we need their expertise in. Now, when talking with Peter and Joan, um, they didn't necessarily have a timeline yet as they recognize there needs to be some planning done here. Um, and, you know, jumping in and saying, let's meet next week, it just isn't the right thing to do. This needs to be well thought out, hence a contemplation about how this is going to take place. I suggested with Gregory that a great time is that, you know, that week of the last week of school when graduation is typically that next Monday is Memorial Day or Labor Day. I always get them confused. That Monday is off, but then Tuesday through Friday would be a great time for us to hold this giving us time to plan up to that. And that's a time before most families or teachers make their plans to get out of town or to go on a little vacation. Uh, if we wait too far in the summer, we'll lose people and, and no one wants to do that. Uh, if we do it too quick, we may not be prepared the way, and I shouldn't even say we, Greg and I don't need to be prepared. It, this is going to happen to us. Uh, this is the time I need to give to Teresa and Joan and Peter, who are kind of facilitating this. Um, Peter, if, if you wanted to say anything, please feel free. I know we, we had a little bit of a conversation. We didn't really talk a date because nothing was planned yet. Let's see. Um. Um, can, excuse me, I'm sorry. Be, before we move on to Peter, could I just ask something about what Frank just said? Yeah, go ahead. Um, so, Frank, in when you spoke about um, the school contemplation involving the board, the admin, and the parents, um, is there a, an awareness, and Gregory, you might be able to answer this question too, that there is more lovers of DMS you know, some might call them lifers that could be past board members, past faculty, past, uh, alumni, parents. Um, are, would they also be able to participate in a school contemplation or is it just for those three areas, Frank, that you spoke about? Well, I can quickly say something there. I, I meant staff too. It's board staff, and I'm staff, and, and families. Um, this is a question that is something that would need to be talked about with our facilitators 
of what are the parameters, and maybe I'm jumping the gun on that answer, but I know that I have not had a, uh, a conversation with any board member about anything but those three groups I mentioned. That doesn't mean that we were saying only, we just haven't thought about that. Am I right in saying that, Greg? Gregory? Yes, I think, you know, the the, the primary con um, groups we thought Concent. about were, the, were those three. But that's not to say that, uh, Barb, the groups you just mentioned are not important and something that we should consider, you know, it, and maybe it's a matter of expanding the the parent category or families category to you know families and alumni uh, or something like that or community know. right uh, okay in, and you know alumni in the broadest sense of the word of people who have you know been a part of the school in some form or another. Um, well, thank you. I appreciate that, guys. I'll I'll I'm done with my turn. Thank you very much. I appreciate that. Yeah. All right. Thanks, Barb. Um, let's see, Peter, what, I'm going to allow you to talk and if you can tell me if you don't want to say anything, but, uh, since we have been saying your name about 50 times now, I thought, <laughs> I thought you should have a chance to, you know, use your own voice. Okay. Yeah. Um, I'm delighted to hear that, um, people are reaching an agreement about going forward with the contemplation and Joan and I are eager to be help as helpful as we can and um, working with Frank and I guess the next step concretely would be for the board to approve a contract with Teresa so that she can um, begin and uh, in order to do that I guess we need to outline some of the specific parameters of her work and what it would um, um, lead to in terms of a report from her at the end of it, whatever. So, um, and th the next step for Joan and I was to meet with Gregory, uh, having met with um, Teresa and Frank to um, work out some of those questions and a timeline as well. So that's where we're at at this point. Yeah, uh, and, and looking forward to that meeting uh, with you, Peter, Joan. Um, I, 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 the, the, the more we talk about it, the more excited I get about seeing it happen and um, moving it along because I, I think we're ready. Gregory, do you want me to reach out to Teresa and have her start thinking about things and sending us back some sort of an invoice so we can get her under contract? I, I think that would be great. And um, I know I've heard from at least one uh, member of the community that they are looking for specific things to help contribute to. And this would be a wonderful specific thing to help the school do. Um, but we need to have a good sense of the cost before we propose that and you know ask for participation in it so the, but the sooner we can get it put a number on it I, I think the better all right so let's uh, go to a question that was submitted ahead of time um, so Larry Grossenbacher, um, and I hope I'm saying that last, right. Let's see, is Larry with us today? Um, I don't see that he's here, but I, I think it's a, a fair question uh, anyway. So he says, I've heard that the early childhood program is still in on campus in a hybrid capacity. I'd like to better understand the decision-making process for allowing that program to continue in person slash hybrid while K through 12 has shifted entirely to virtual. I'd imagine that the standards used to decide a virtual versus hybrid would be consistently across the 
school based on data presented at previous board meetings, uh, and then he links to the DHS school benchmarks website. Uh, so let me ad address that if, from one one aspect of it, and that's number one: the the school benchmarks that we look at are for K through twelve schools. Um, so DMS has two components to it. We have a public charter K through twelve school, and then we have a private early childhood program, you know, preschool, essentially, and different considerations come into play for both because I th we do have to make one decision, I think, for K through 12 because that is the public charter portion of our school. Um, the early childhood is a little bit different. Um, it's private, so it's regulated differently. Um, the state has not issued any guidance on preschools at all, really. And if, if you go around town, you will find that many, many, many preschools are open and doing business because they're considered just a regular business. Um, the other thing is that our early childhood program this year is extraordinarily small. It's, Frank, is it six students or, or eight? I, I think we have six and two are believe it or not, have chosen remote. So our teacher is with six, sends them home, and then does the two remote with them in the afternoon. Huh, okay. Very difficult. <laughs> yeah. So so you can imagine that it's one thing to make a decision for 280 students, roughly, um, and it's another thing to make a decision for eight students under a different regulatory framework. So th does that sound inconsistent in some ways? Yeah, I, I will candidly admit that does sound a little bit inconsistent. Um, but we're trying to do the best we can for the private program, which is just tiny. And we're trying to do the best we can consistent with a significantly different number of people who would stand to be on campus and present and interacting and breathing in the same rooms. Um, which raises, I think, a, a different set of concerns and raises the risk analysis uh, quite a bit for, um, you know, nine different or uh, 12, 13 different grade levels coming back. Frank, do you want to add anything to that? Um, the only other thing that complicates it is the private school, those people pay tuition to come in and our staff member is paid through that tuition. The staff member has a contract. And if those people said, we're not doing it that way, so we're not paying anymore, we are liable. And we're, I'm concerned that we would have to take money out of the public charter part, which we're not allowed to do technically by state process. And so I look, no one wants to say this is strictly about the dollars because that really isn't it. But there is a piece in our mind that, oh my gosh, if, if that went away, how would we pay that staff member? Because they have a contract and that's problematic. Right. Right. It, it, it's like all things COVID. It's a situation where there is not a good, clear, easy answer. It, it, everything is a compromise of some sort. All right. So let's switch back to a live question. Um, go ahead and raise your hand if you'd like to talk. And, and for those who have joined since I gave my little introduction, there should be a raise hand button somewhere at the bottom of your Zoom screen. Well, I'm not seeing any at the moment. Um, so why don't we do this? Um, 
One of the questions we've gotten through email has been about the high school and what's going on with the high school and what are the plans for the high school? And since um, we have Christy here, who's a high school teacher, and Frank, who um, before joining our school was a principal of a high school of uh, almost 3,000 students, if my memory serves right. Um, I've been in several schools from 1,800 to 3,000, yes. Yeah, so I know that they have lots of good ideas. So, uh, what what are your plans, guys? Christy, I'm gonna let you go first because you haven't talked yet, and we would love to hear from you. <laughs> I'm happy. I'm happy to join in. Um, so, thanks for the question. Uh, we there has been there have been many conversations about how. Do we grow the high school? How do we recruit students? Um, how do we bolster the curriculum with more arts, music, uh, theater, sports? How do we build those extracurriculars that, that students crave and that they, uh, you know, that, that bring them joy and a sense of belonging, a sense of community? We've been talking about it. Um, there are ideas in in the making, uh, possibilities. We need to reach out to perhaps um, other schools that offer art programs. Perhaps there could be a partnership with other schools around the valley. We have talked about reaching out to local community colleges, uh, seeing if we could um, again bring about a partnership, maybe for glass blowing and blacksmithing, these arts overall, in my experience, have been uh, resoundingly uh, encouraged by the students themselves. Um, they love the programming, they love the arts. Um, however, it's extremely expensive. It's expensive to hire an individual who has the expertise to teach the material and also bring in the materials and purchase the materials, um, bring it all to campus. It's been problematic um, and it's something that we just can't afford right now. There's a possibility that with these connections with uh, local agencies, uh, maybe it's some South Mountain Community College, maybe it's Gateway Community College, um, they have glass blowing, they have, uh, blacksmithing, and all of the equipment is there and ready to be used. All of it is, is prepped and ready. So could it be that we then ask the parents to contribute um, some monetary uh, amount to create a program that is um, in connection with those campuses? Um, you know, as far as... Uh, Transportation, we'll have to work that out. Uh, could it be that these, these art classes happen on Tuesday, Thursday, and we shorten the day at our campus on those days and then transport students to the campuses? Um, these are all ideas that we're having. With regard to the curriculum itself, we would love to expand uh, and really... Um, encourage uh, an embracing of sustainability. We feel we have the campus that can be almost like a living laboratory, a living experiential um, conditions that can allow us to, to grow in that way. Um, many conversations have been had in this regard. Um, so it's, it's in planning. Um, I feel we need to think creatively about the future, about how do we recruit students. Um, one of the ideas as far as recruitment is to um, um, communicate the Instagram that Ms. Joelle Reiling created uh, and uh, continue to upload for that and, and really get the word out. Um, if no one knows we exist, how are we going to get students? Uh, how are they gonna know how, how much we offer and how much we care? Um, I, I think also we've been talking about um, recruitment 
in the old fashioned way, putting flyers on community door doors, you know, um, trying to get the word to people that we exist and we are here and this is what we offer and allow them to see who we are and um, how we can, how we can reach students. Um, we're still uh, accepting new students in the high school at this point, um, even though there may not be a, uh, a monetary benefit for the remainder of the year. But to grow, we need to really uh, gain as many students as we possibly can. Um, so those are some ideas so far. Um, of course, af after school clubs, how do we bring in music? How do we bring back a, mu a, a theater program? These are all things that would be ideal and would be uh, beneficial. Um, and the more students we get, the more finances we have to work with to be able to pay individuals with these skills. So I'm optimistic. I'm very uh, encouraged by Frank's uh, energy and his get it done attitude. He's very much in support of growing the school all, all together and also growing the high school. Uh, so I'm, I'm really um, looking forward to what can happen in the future. Frank, you're not, I'm not sure you're trying to talk, but we're not having trouble hearing you. I lost the last uh, three sentences of Christy. Um, but I'll jump in now because I can see she's done talking. I would say uh, I ditto everything Christy just said. Um, I am pleasantly surprised that my initial meeting with the high school was really open armed to what ideas can we generate to grow the high school. Everyone out there needs to know that group of staff members absolutely wants to grow the high school. As a matter of fact, she didn't say it. We have a new kid starting Monday who, who showed up on our doorstep Friday afternoon. Uh, we were able to register him and he is starting classes on Monday. Correct, Christy? Yeah, she. She, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. So, yes, they are open armed to ideas and how we can get more people uh, in our high school. Um, they have heard me describe uh our campus as Biosphere 3, and that we really should be looking at it as something for sustainability because it's all right there. We have, a, we have a farm, we have a zoo, we have a riparian. We're in the middle of a little forest. It's remarkable the things we could do with science and sustainability, and they're excited about that. Um, at least everyone I've talked to, no one has poo-pooed any idea of moving forward they really want fresh new ideas and they're, they're the ones generating them. It's not like I sent them a piece of paper and said, do this. This is coming from them. Robotics, um, um, theater, um, Spanish full time. There is so much they've been talking about choir, uh, strings, uh, sp sports that wouldn't cost so much like golf or tennis, which there's two golf. You, you cut out again. Hmm. Athletics. Uh, we want to bring back the Frisbee and the soccer and the uh, volleyball, because I know we've done those in the past. Um, it's just a matter of getting organized and doing it as we move forward. Uh, Christy did say it would be really important. Can you guys still hear me? Yes. Okay. Uh, Christy did tell me it would be really important that I need to get back out. I need to go visit some of these schools right in the area that we might be able to partner with. I haven't had a chance to do that yet as the day-to-dayness. Um, there's been a lot to do on this learning curve I have right now. 
but clearly we have a school right on our corner at 28th. Maybe they're trying to figure out a way to have an art teacher as well. And we can go in together and the art teacher comes to our campus in the morning and goes to their campus in the afternoon. And there's a full-time teacher. They pay for half, we pay for half. There could be lots of opportunities like that, that we haven't even investigated yet. And I know that's my job to do and I will get to it. I'm just, um, I'm spending some time with, needed time with staff and parents right now um, as everyone has a lot of stuff to tell me. And that's okay. I, I recognize that's a priority right now. Thank you both for talking about that. Uh, I see we have a, a written question from an anonymous attendee. Um, and there are two questions actually. The first one is, can you clarify what on-site services is and who is eligible for that? Do you want me to do that? Greg? Yeah, go, go ahead. Okay. There are certain conditions that the state has put out to us that would qualify a student to have to be in front of us. Please know that does not mean in front of their classroom teacher. It means they have to come to campus. One of the examples could be a student on an IEP with certain special education needs that we have to service per their IEP. Um, that student is in a classroom and right now we have grouped them. Uh, there's a first grade, room with two fourth graders. There's a second, third, fourth, fifth room, and there's a six, seven, eight room. There is also uh, a room at the high school, and I, I think we're at about eight kids at the high school. Christy, is that correct? She's nodding. Yes. Um, what we have here in those rooms, and the reason they're separated into rooms, is we wanted to make sure the number was manageable for one adult. So right now, no room is over 11. If I get to a point that it, a room we get to 14, 15, I would have to hire another substitute slash aid to be in that room. Um, some other criteria to be in the on-site room. Uh, it could be our counselor, Sarah, who works very closely with our families, has uncovered a social emotional need that she comes to me and says, Frank, I have this student who is struggling with a social emotional need. I'm going to recommend that we bring them on site them staying at home is not working right now. It might be short term. We don't know, but I need to get them in front of an adult. And so we work through that and add a kid here, add a kid there. The third reason the state has said is if there is a safety issue at home, a student is unsafe staying at home. This can be several reasons it could be something that is a social issue in that family, or it could be simply both parents have to work and can't leave a second grader home alone. So they have to go somewhere and be supervised. And we have more than a couple of students who are in that circumstance. Um, I think I've touched on all of those. Um, Christy, unless you're aware of something that I'm not those seem to be the three big reasons why a student can be on campus in the on-site program. I think that covers it. I think there's also another condition uh, where perhaps the student doesn't have internet or a device to use, um, then we will do our best to accommodate on campus. That is correct. Um, as you know, we've been able to give any student a device. However, some homes don't have internet service. And so push comes to shove, the family has tried to get that and it has fallen through. We allow that student to come on campus and sit in the on-site room with a tablet and use our internet. Does that answer the question, Gregory? I well think enough? quite thoroughly. Um, okay. 
And, and then there was a, a second part of this uh, anonymous attendees question, uh, which I think is one others may have too. So let's go ahead and dive into it. Um, this person writes, it seems to me that we are only currently taking into consideration physical health in our return to school and not taking a look at the mental health impact on students. Many districts around our state have resumed school, keeping in mind how students are currently suffering from exponentially higher rates of self-harm, suicide attempts, and ideation uh, and depression. Why aren't we taking this into consideration? So, so let me take a first stab at that. Um, and Danielle, we haven't heard from you yet today, so why don't you, you jump in too? Um, I, number one, yes, we are taking that into consideration, but but it's it's a balance of where do you draw the line between what is an acceptable level of physical risk um, versus an acceptable level of emotional, you know, social risk, and it, it's it, it's not an easy answer to find, and and the. The science uh, continues to change both on um, what we know about coronavirus in schools uh, and uh, what we know about the social emotional impacts on children um, at various grade levels from virtual only learning or hybrid learning. Um, so it, it, it's not an easy question to answer, especially when, um, and that question has fallen to the board, um, we are not public health experts, either on physical health or social emotional health, uh, as much as we might like to be. Um, so we're doing the best we can, and Arizona's um, Department of Health Services has said, said a you know, if you look at nationally, what metrics schools have uh, chosen to be the cutoff point where they say, okay, too much risk, let's close down for a while until things clear up a little bit. Um, it, it's very generous in, in terms of allowing cases to go higher, positivity rates to go higher, hospitalizations to go higher before saying, okay, we recommend going virtual. Um, so they want to see above 10% um, for all three benchmarks before they would suggest going all virtual. And that's what we've agreed to follow. It, it, is that the right answer? Uh, you know, I, I think that's certainly open to reasonable debate. But I, I'm going to stop talking now and let Danielle. Thank you. Um, and I have a follow-up question. I, really, I raised my hand. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I mean, we're our children. We're the parents. You got to be an advocate for your student and have that dialogue with your teacher. Have that dialogue with Frank to find out if 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 there is an evaluation that needs to be done. You know, I heard Frank mention um, Miss Bays. So if you've got something you're experiencing, you you just got to reach out and know that there's resources. This isn't anything we've ever been through before, and we want to do the very best we can. Is it's so new for all of us. So we definitely want to help develop creative methods and make sure that all our students are being taken care of. But we don't know if you're if you're not telling us. And I know I certainly experienced that with my daughter last year, and and uh, it's a much better place this year. And then I would like to ask, um, with the middle school, are we since we are in a virtual option, have we been reaching out to our middle schoolers? to invite them into the high school? Are we doing virtual um, shadows or mentor days like we have in the past? Is that happening or getting ready to happen? Thank, I'll, I'll speak. <laughs> um, thank you for the question, Danielle. Um, we historically invite the middle school eighth grade uh, up to shadow for a day. Um, up until last year, this was happening and. February uh, before spring break. Um, this year, of course, is a little different. So I think it's an excellent idea to invite students in to the online classes. It's unfortunate that it's just not a not an accurate reflection of how, how 
um, how much of a community we are in the high school. Uh, but if we can't do anything else, um, I think it's worth a try. Um, it could be that if things somewhat return to a hybrid model, uh, perhaps post uh, spring break, uh, then we can reach out to families and invite students in as long as families and students feel comfortable um, coming up. Um, I'm hoping that that's the case. Um, I'd like to also organize um, a, a meeting or a, a, a high school information night, like what we've done in the past. Uh, and this year it may be virtual. Maybe we have two of them. Maybe, uh, I'm not sure. Um, but those are in the work and I think it's, uh, I think it's a good question. And I don't know if there can be any kind of buddy system going on for sixth, seventh, and eighth to have um, a high school mentor. I just really want to foster those relationships to retain the students we have. Yeah, that's a really good point. Um, it's not something that we historically have done to reach down into sixth, seventh, and eighth, um, but it's a possibility. And I will definitely take it back to the faculty and, and have a discussion on how, how could we make this work? How could this be um, a reality? Thanks. Yeah, I, just speaking from personal experience, my uh, second grader had an eighth grade buddy and who talks endlessly about the eighth grade buddy. It's, you know, like the coolest person on the planet. So, you know, if we can foster some kind of dynamic like that, where the, you know, the upperclassmen maybe of the high school are reaching down into six, seven, eight to, show them why the high school is such a great place. That, that all sounds fantastic. So th thank you, Danielle, for bringing that up and Christy for taking it back. Um, let's see, uh, there is a hand raised by Adeline Carrera, who is, we've not heard from yet today. So I'm gonna promote her to talking. Adeline, what question Hello. can we answer for you today? Ashley and Danielle kind of stole mine, but I'll add to it. <laughs> it's okay. Good, good minds think alike, right? Um, so I, I was also going to be in that realm of growing the high school from within, uh, sixth, seventh, and eighth. Uh, just to give Frank some insight on me, I am a kindergarten mom now, and I am a high school mom since actually my Emma has been there since eighth grade. So I've experienced what it was like to kind of be pulled into the high school, having those shadow days. So I have the experience of that as a parent um, and I can't say nothing but good things about it. Um, so I love the idea of having like a buddy system besides the, you know, having them shadow, also having maybe 12th, 11th and 10th shadow 6th, 7th and 8th, I, you know, or buddy them up. Um, that would be awesome. Um, the other thing I might... Um, might suggest is maybe, uh, I appreciate Christine mentioning that there's going to possibly be a um, kind of a high school info night or, or I guess a virtual open house. Um, I know that everything seems to be virtual right now, but is there any chance that we can do that um, for more than just high school? Because again, I don't think it should be all put on high school that we have to build the high school up the enrollment. I think it needs to start from even, you know, lower grades, you know, kindergarten parents, you know, parents should be hearing more about it. Um, and I think teachers uh, in those lower grades need to somehow have better relationships with those teachers in the high school so that there is this continuity of care as well as the partnership of, of we're all a team, we're all, we're all working on this common goal of having our, our students stay from whatever grade they might enter all the way through high school and not just, you know, head up to eighth grade and then, okay, now you got to go decide where you want to go. Mm, you know, DMS should probably be there first, hopefully. Um, but I was wondering if, um, I guess what my initial question would be, is if there's any chance to actually set, sorry, actually set specific open houses for both preschool, kindergarten, um, 
as well as uh, sixth grade. I know a lot of other schools, like they're, they have a middle school, like they go up to sixth grade. So maybe have our middle school have an open house, a consistent open house every year, you know, twice a year probably would be good, um, as well as the high school. And then, you know, and, and, and hopefully have it like on a calendar so that when people are like looking for schools, they go to our calendar and they say, oh, oh, wonderful. They're going to have an open house coming up in February. All right. You know what I mean? So that these parents can, can not only see what we've got going on, but they can also see that we are consistent in our efforts to bring more families in. So that's it. <laughs> well, Thank I you. can go ahead and address that. Um, I don't know if we've had open houses in the past. I've only been on for four weeks, but I absolutely believe we should have an open house for all, the whole school. Um, and I don't know why it would have to be on separate nights other than you might have a kid in, in three classes and then that makes it really difficult to get to all three rooms. So maybe it does have to be in uh, on separate nights, but yes, we should have an open house. Um, for those of you who don't know, our lottery is next Friday and we have 111 kids on a wait list right now to join our school next year. I will say 44 of those are kindergartners coming into kindergarten. So our K-1-2 is the bulk of our students. They, for some reason, um, the younger kids are, and families are very much drawn uh, to our Waldorf community. And then, as you know, by eighth grade, they start to choose other places. And that was the conversation that the high school teachers and Christy and I had about why would they choose other places. And it was about electives and athletics in a nutshell. So that that spurred our conversation of boosting those programs. But yes, Ms. Carrera, I agree. There should be open houses and I will make sure we do that. Wonderful. Thank you so much. I appreciate mm -hmm. it. I don't know who it was, but thank you for the uh, chimes and the uh, birds chirping. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what that is either, but it's a nice sound. Um, all right, let's jump back quickly to an email question we got ahead of time. Uh, this one, Colleen, you're here. Do you want to say these questions live? You can raise your hand if you do. Otherwise, I'll read them for you. Okay. Uh, let's Go ahead, Colleen. You're still on mute, by the way. Okay, I have two questions. Um, when will the school hire a full-time permanent pedagogical director and accountant? Both these roles are important to the stability and success of DMS and existed just a few years ago. So that is, both of those are on our to-do list um, and, and they're high priority items, both of them. The, the limiting factor has been uh, funding. You know, we, we have a $2,100 per student gap in funding versus what regular public schools get. So that's, it's gotta come from somewhere. And our enrollment um, is down this year, to be candid. It sounds like it's, uh, uh, you know, we've got 111 students on the wait list, like Frank just said. Um, the more students we have, the more we can boost those types of things. Um, we have an outside accountant right now, um, Priscilla Garza, who's at Aspire. Um, she's been doing a wonderful job. But um, And then we also have uh, a former uh, parent and board member who's seen as a bookkeeper for us. So those rules are being filled kind of on a part-time basis, if we're outsourcing it. Um, I agree with you, Colleen, it would be great if we could have uh, one person in-house doing both of those. Um, it just hasn't been financially feasible yet. On the pedagogical director, um, we we have a 
you know, a group of teachers, which Christy is a part of. Christy, do you want to talk about the pedagogical leadership at the school and how that's structured right now? So currently, uh, the pedagogy and the support of the teachers in that way uh, with regards to the curriculum falls in the hands of the members of the LDC. Um, we strive to support our teachers um, in each of the realms. So you probably know that we have one uh, in the early childhood, and three in the grades, and then two in the high school. Um, and we really do our best to um, be a support system for the teachers. Uh, and that's really the design that we are operating under at this time. Um, I don't personally see uh, the necessity for a pedagogical director at this time. Uh, if we can make this work in a sustainable, healthy uh, way. Yeah. May I make a follow-up point to that before I go on my next question? All right. We have seen an alarming loss of trained faculty. So I do not see the current model as successful and certainly not sustainable. And that has certainly led to the decrease in our enrollment. Mm -hmm. So those things to me are very much tied that we have, um, we do in fact have qualified teachers. They are well supported um, and that we can offer this great experience to as many children as possible. But if you look at the numbers, that's not what's happening at this time. And pedagogical director is, is a standard in, in schools across um, many curriculum, not just Waldorf, but um, different kinds of schools. Having that person in administration to see the big picture um, so that the teachers focus on their classes and somebody who is not in the class focuses um, on supporting the teachers. Yeah, there, there are different models. Um, and I think, as you know, Colleen, a couple of years ago, we went through a, a fairly rigorous exercise and it picked this model for ourselves and have been going with it for a couple of years. Um, it, you're correct. We have had, um, I think, a unacceptably high level of turnover uh, in the past. I think that's been fueled by a lot of different things. I think it's hard to point the finger at any one particular thing. Um, you know, we had trouble with our finances. We didn't have a, you know, a real permanent leader um, like we have now. Um, then the coronavirus hit and, you know, families made totally different choices uh, on what they were going to do with their kids. Um, Frank, I, I think you you have some insight onto kind of what's happening valley wide as far as enrollment, physical enrollment in schools. Um, you bet. Um, and it's it's not just Desert Marigold being affected. Um, pick a school, pick a district, charter or public, it doesn't matter. Parents in droves are withdrawing their kids saying, we're homeschooling. And that's a tricky answer because we find out that they really don't go through the steps to sign up with the state for the official homeschooling. They just are saying, this isn't working. I'm just going to keep my kid home. And of course, the problem is the state is going to hold that against us in the next budget because they're going to budget us on who's enrolled. And if those kids have withdrawn and not gone to homeschooling, they're just disappeared, and we know they haven't left the state necessarily. Um, all districts are facing this. It is an issue. Um, I, we've never seen this before. This, you, me, everyone knows this is the most different and challenging time, not just for education, for your jobs, <laughs> for living, for trying to be the happy people we're supposed to be, and we we all want this to end tomorrow, but that isn't enough to make it happen, of course. Um, we're all muddling through it, doing the best we can. Parents are doing the best they can as parents at home with kids online. Teachers are doing the best they can. Obviously, so the kids are doing the best they can. Um, but it is affecting the budget. 
And, you know, state law says you have to be in school up to your 16th birthday. We know that's not happening right now, guys. People are just calling it homeschooling and they're just not bringing their kids to school. It's on the rise everywhere. Well, I agree that coronavirus has certainly made life all over more difficult, but our budget problems, our retention, our employee retention problems, and our enrollment problems existed prior to corona. So, now that you, you know, resolve my question today, but I do want to put it out there that um, this seems like a very important piece of the puzzle that is not currently there. And I'll move on to my next question. I was shocked to hear at the last board meeting that April Sauer had posted what amounts to a cold call for board members. And this is alarming. Why would anyone from the board make the unprecedented move to solicit future board members from a random website? Board members should have a strong foundation as well as continuing education in public Waldorf education. Yeah, I'll, I'll tackle that. So th th a couple of things there. Number one, I don't think we as a community want to have a Waldorf purity test before we let anybody in. Um, there are lots of people who are excited about Waldorf education and what it has to offer. And the only way that they can get experience in it is by doing it and joining and being invited into the community. So it, I, I, that, that's one broad statement. Another thing is the five board members that we do have right now uh, have a long history with Waldorf education. Um, and if we were to bring on, you know, one or two board members who don't have that, you know, strong history, but have skill sets, we would really like to have on the board, like someone who has great insight into fundraising and marketing and advertising the school. Um, somebody who has experience with grant writing um, and applying for grants. Uh, somebody who has experience in, um, you know, uh, really connecting with uh, colleges outside of campus and, you know, making our campus seem like a place that colleges want to recruit at. Um, these these are skill sets that are not, you know, you don't have to be bathed in Waldorf, um, the, you know, to, to be able to perform these skills, um, but you can do them for our school. We need them. So for us to say, well, if you don't have, it, and then the other problem is like, well, okay, what's the criteria? How much Waldorf? you know, how much Waldorf experience and what kind of experience are we going to accept um, before we say, okay, you're eligible to be on the board. I just, I think we would be losing talent uh, that we could otherwise have when we're looking for uh, people with skill sets to add uh, to our board membership. Um, so is it problematic to just post on a website that is for bringing, you know, board members with skills to nonprofits? You know, I don't think so. There's a, a pretty lengthy vetting process that comes after somebody even applies to the board and they would have to come to two of our meetings um, and attend and then put in an application and go through a couple meetings worth of interviews. Danielle knows she just went through it. Um, you know, it's, it's not the easiest process. Um, and the last thing I'll say on that uh, is that you said, sh shouldn't they have continuing education in Waldorf um, and a commitment to it? I think there, I agree with you a hundred percent. Yes. And that's something I think we as a board could do better at is bringing in more speakers like Liz Bevan on a regular basis so that board members are getting you know, steeped in this stuff regularly. Danielle, do you want to add anything to that? I wasn't aware other than the board meeting that that had even happened. So I haven't looked at that um, board um, building website, but I would agree that we do want some skills 
that we don't currently have on the board and whatever we need to do to help incorporate that could be a good thing. And again, with the vetting process. All right, well, Colleen, thanks for joining us live and thanks for sending your question in advance. Um, I look forward to continuing the conversation with you. All right, we've got a couple more hands up here. Um, well, it's Danielle uh, Ippoliti. I hope you'll correct can me. Can you hear me okay? Yes, Frank, we can hear you. Uh, Miss Egan, I saw your question about trying to recruit at the charter schools that only go up to eighth grade. And um, I already have a list of those provided to me by Miss Cummings, who is our high school counselor. And it is my goal to get out to those schools before spring break to drop flyers off and or call to see when their registration period, when they let high schools come to register at their school, because I want to bring Crystal over with me and possibly a student um, to be at a table in their gym like I know how other registrations go. So that's all. I just wanted to comment on that. Thanks, Frank. Um, Danielle, uh, you sent a number of questions ahead of time. Thank you for doing that. Um, so I'm not sure if we have time to address all of them uh, in detail, but why don't you pick the first couple that uh, we haven't touched on yet that you'd like to hear about? Um, well, actually I had raised my hand because I've, there, um, Christy was talking about the LDC and who's represented on that. And I just want to go back and ask um, why the humanities teachers or specialty teachers are not represented on the LDC. So I, I understand your question. Uh, when the qualifications for being on this um, committee were formed, uh, we had certain requirements uh, as far as um, state certified, um, ideally Waldorf certified, um, three years teaching at DMS uh, or five years teaching altogether, um, uh, including other uh, requirements. Currently, although it's being reviewed, uh, this may change, um, but currently we don't have any representatives in the specialties group who qualify under those circumstances. Now, again, I want to say that we are going to, in the next couple of weeks, relook at, are these um, ideal conditions for joining? Do we need to alter our requirements? Um, and really looking at our role um, again, and evaluating ourselves, um, perhaps even with an outside uh, mediator. So it's it's not permanent. Um, I see the value in uh, having a representative from the specialty groups, certainly. Yeah, definitely. So uh, it may change. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, thank you for that. And I'm glad that it is being visited um, revisited to look at possibilities of um, having humanities on your LDC. Um, so I know, Greg, you had also touched a little bit on um, part of my questions and in answering somebody else's question. Um, let me just review. <laughs> yes, I did ask to send you a few questions, but let me look and see which one. Um, so you were talking about whether the board members. OK, well, I'm just going to instead of me trying to reiterate my question, I'm going to read it out. Go for um, it. As you all know, Waldorf education is very unique and beautiful. Our teachers are required to have Waldorf education so they know how to administer Waldorf education to our children. 
wouldn't it make sense for our administration, staff, and board members to have the same knowledge or training about Waldorf education so that they can run our school with complete knowledge and understanding as to why and what they are doing? If so, will the school start with the current administration, staff, board members needing to take Waldorf Foundations class or something like that? And will there be like a timeline, a deadline as to when they have to complete that requirement? Um, I understand that you are saying you don't want to deter board members from, you know, like grant writers, because that was another one of my questions. I'm glad to hear that you're looking at getting grant writers on the board. It is so important. And yeah, if they don't have Waldorf um, background before being approved to be on the board, certainly they could start looking into what Waldorf is um, after they become a board member, correct? And I mean, so I'll leave that question out there. Yeah, I, I want to circle back to the the contemplation exercise that we're going to be doing, hopefully in the near future, because I think this kind of addresses this this issue that you and Colleen are bringing up of, you know, how do we know the people who are in leadership positions at the school are really dedicated to a Waldorf methodology, curriculum, um, philosophy, anthroposophy. And I think, you know, one, there are a couple answers to that. You know, one is, well, they are choosing to be a part of our school, which is, uh, you know, the whole purpose of it is to provide a Waldorf education within a public charter school context. So by, you know, just kind of by opting in, they're demonstrating that they are interested, that they are dedicated, that they're interested in doing it. The, you know, is there a specific set of curriculum that we ought to require for everybody, uh, no matter their position in the school? I don't know if that's necessary. I think there's a lot of continuing education that goes on. I mean, being a lifelong learner is just part of Waldorf education. And, you know, I don't, it, think we would take anyone on in, in a leadership position who isn't dedicated to that principle. Um, the, the other thing I'd say is like doing this contemplation exercise is going to let us align on, you know, a lot of the important questions about what are our values. And it's kind of like, if you agree with all of our values, and what we're trying to accomplish here, and you want to be a part of it, do I need you to have a specific certification before I'm going to let you in the club? You know, I, I, I'm really hesitant to say that because we're trying to grow and we're trying to bring people in and we're trying to be warm and welcoming. And from my perspective, I, I don't want to make our school seem inaccessible because like, well, I, you know, I don't, have five years of Waldorf experience. So, you know, am I even qualified? I, you know, it, if there is a, you know, phenomenal person who has a wonderful skill set as a teacher, for example, who is really interested in teaching the Waldorf method and has a proven history of being an excellent teacher, is that someone we ought to give a chance and to, to learn the Waldorf method and to, to, participate in our school, we have a, it's such a hard time finding good teachers who are willing to commit, you know, it, it's, do we really want to rule people out based on, the, you know, a certain set of criteria? Now, that said, obviously, we're looking for people who have that history. That would be extremely helpful. Um, you know, th there's a certain learning curve in, in the Waldorf world. Um, and if we could jumpstart that by finding people who already have it, then great. But do we really want to limit ourselves by excluding people who who don't have uh, a certain level of Waldorf experience? And I'm, I'm not convinced that we do. Um, 
I'm not necessarily saying that we need to exclude anybody. And I wasn't actually talking about teachers because my understanding is the teachers have to get some form of Waldorf education uh, or training to teach this uh, students. I was talking more the board, the staff, the administration, and, and I'm not saying they need to be certified in anything, but certainly having some kind of um, like taking classes with Joan Treadaway or reading the book engaged communities or any of the Rudolf Steiner books um, just to have a real, you know, foundation of sorts as to because Waldorf is so different and I went to public school and I and I was a public school teacher and my children have always gone to a Waldorf school and there's a reason because <laughs> it is so much better and it's very different than what I personally experienced as a student and I gave as a teacher so if people coming in have only had public school type education uh, experience, then it's kind of hard for them to shift gears and see the bigger picture of, you know, what we are. Ms. Hippolyti, I can answer a little bit of that. Sure. Um, I have committed to the board that I would attend a training um, preferably as soon as possible, but if it had to be over the summer, because that's when a lot of national trainings are, mm -hmm. I have every intention of doing that. And prior to that, of course, I have reached out to uh, Mr. Rennick and Ms. Treadaway for some tutoring, some knowledge base, some conversations like you alluded to. Um, I also received a beautiful basket my first two days on the job from one of our staff members with several books and wonderful bread <laughs> in the basket. Mm -hmm. And I've been reading those. So I can tell you that I am trying my very best to be a sponge and take in as much of Waldorf as I can. On a funny note, um, as I was meeting with the specials last week and I allowed the teachers to ask me, you know, what tell Oh, you've cut out on us, Frank. On a good part, too. <laughs> I know. <laughs> Cliff Ager. So that I can have a Tootsie Roll when I want, but no one will, no kids will be able to see that I have candy out on display. I can respect that very easily. And I, I thought the teacher did it in a, a, a very cute way, if you will. Uh-huh. Frank, you cut out on us for, I think, the first half of that story oh, leading to the, it. the candy. <laughs> <laughs> About the humanities uh, meeting. Yes, yes. It was about the specials and how one of the teachers in her very special way said, uh, Mr. Maurizio, you know, you have a candy jar on your desk and that just is not the Waldorf way. And uh, we laughed about it. And I said, I promise I'll move the candy jar. Don't worry about it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but that was her way of telling me, of teaching me, well, you shouldn't, that's something we don't do. We don't, teachers don't bring candy to school for kids to see. And I get it. So I'll take care of that, but I am learning so much every day as I as I go along. Great, and I'm I'm excited to that you're on board, and I hear a lot of good things. So I'm excited about meeting you eventually. Please, the next time you're there, stop in. I'll, I'll drop everything I have just to say hello. I've been trying <laughs> to do that with every parent um, who steps up on that that porch. I'm out there in the morning greeting uh, some of the on-site kids and every once in a while a parent will wave me over to the car and it's just to say hello. They're so friendly. Everybody's so friendly. That's awesome. Yeah, great. Gregory, can I ask one more question? Yeah, go for it. Okay, so I'm going to read it again. Um, traditionally, it is the community that elects board members. Is there a reason why this is not done at Desert Marigold? And as a community member, I feel my voice is not heard when electing board members. And then I would also like to 
maybe there could be some term limits on each of the board positions? Yeah, well, there are term limits uh, on the board positions. So it's, oh, okay. it's a three-year term. Um, and then you can be elected again. Um, and then there's a, after six years, you have to stop uh, at least for one year. And then you could be elected again. Okay. Um, and then the, each of the, the officer positions are one year terms. Mm -hmm. uh, and then you would have to be elected into them again. Um, but the, the term limits on those positions are just concurrent with the other term limits. Um, so that was the easy, easy one. Uh, the harder one is why, uh, why do, why does the board elect other board members? And that's kind of weird. Um, that's, I mean, that's definitely not how it works in the public school system. Um, you know, it's a, it's on your ballot and you, you, you pick board members. Right. Um, so why did we do it differently? I don't know the answer uh, for certain, but I can tell you it's in our bylaws that that's how we do it. Um, certainly we could think about changing the bylaws, um, but I would want to know a little bit more about the history there. And I, I don't know if you were able to join us on Wednesday um, but Liz Bevin was telling us, you know, she was really pushing us to do the historical work about, you know, how did we get to where we are today and what, um, what led to, for us to convert from a private school to a charter school and then what have been the major challenges along the way. And so I don't know what happened along the way where the board said, we are going to elect other board members. Um, you know, I can speculate, but I, I don't want to throw something out there without knowing why. Um, mm -hmm. From a from a governance perspective, I you know, it, it could be one of the, the you know, it could be it's coming from kind of your perspective. Like, don't we want to limit the school to um, people who know what they're doing with Waldorf? And the current board at the time knew what they were doing with Waldorf. And they said, okay, well, we're going to pick, we're going to be the gatekeepers. Um, we're not going to have a popular vote on this, but I don't know. Okay. Well, thank you for that. Yeah. Um, thanks, thanks for the questions. Yeah, and for I'd being be curious to find out, but maybe there's a chance of changing that. Cause I think it would just help, um, the community as a whole to feel like they're being heard. That's just one way we would feel like we're being heard if we had a say in who were our board members. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and we want the community to feel heard. Yeah. So well, let me put some thought into that. And, you, you know, I, I, and let me do some his, historical work there. No, I'll, I'll circle back to you. Okay. Thank you, Gregory. Thanks, everybody. All right. So we are, I scheduled this for 3 to 4.30. Um, There's still 28 people here. I see three hands up. Um, other panelists, uh, are you guys okay to continue for until 5 o'clock, say? <laughs> Danielle, I can go a little longer. A little longer. Can you still hear me? Yes. Can you mute me? Mute yes. Me, yep. I'm gonna. I'm Thank gonna take you. You, take you off right now. Okay. All right. Um, let's see. Kristen Ziegenbein, someone we haven't heard from yet, and I see you also had a Q and A uh, question. Hi, thanks for having a town hall. Yes, sorry uh, it took so long. Yeah, so I did have some Q&A questions. I just wasn't sure if you were still looking through there. But um, mostly I was really excited to hear about the high school having a focus towards some sustainability. One of the main reasons that we enrolled in the school was the biodynamic garden and um, the opportunities that that brought for my children. And we've been really disappointed in how that's gone over the last two years. And my middle schooler didn't really have 
um, much activity in the garden. Um, his class was kind of kept out of there for a while. And I was just hoping that there would be some clarity on if there's going to be more of a gardening program again, if we're going to direct um, an actual teacher to hold the garden and bring classes through, or if it's going to all fall individually on the grades teachers or the high school programs can have their own, just to know more what's happening there. Greg, do you want me to take a shot at this? Yeah, please jump um, in. Well, there is a list, um, Ms. Zingenbein, of wants and needs from staff to capital items like a multi-purpose room and tearing down the wood shop, putting a new wood shop, changing over the, uh, the septic system to the city sewer. And then all of the things you heard Christy and I talk about from sustainability to uh, fine arts, music, um, all these things cost money. At this point, in talking with Mr. Schantz, who loves being part of that garden, um, and he says we really need to put efforts into this garden, and I believe him. The garden is awesome. If you were to ask me today, do I have $60,000 to hire a teacher to be the full-time garden teacher? The answer is no, I do not. Um, all of these things are budget items, and at some point, we're going to have to prioritize which one's first? Is the multi-purpose room first? Is the fine arts teacher first? Is the sustainability teacher first? We have lots of ideas of what we want to do. Obviously, uh, getting them all done in one year is going to be monumental. It's not going to happen. We can't do them all in one year. Um, but we're going to have to come together and create a priority of do this one first. And Again, I love all the ideas being generated. We haven't taken the next step to say, which one are we going to do first? Um, thank you. I suppose our garden is something that would be more of like a returning idea rather than an entirely new idea with the way that it was ran previously. But I understand that there are budgetary constraints. It's really affected our view of the school over the last couple of years. But thank you. Okay. Kristen, I saw that you also had a question about teacher retention and recruiting. Do, do you want to ask? Yeah. That? Um, yeah, I would love to hear more about what we're going to do to help our teachers want to stay at the school. Um, I had to withdraw my third grader this year because she was not doing well with the hybrid format. But she was on her fifth teacher. She had two substitutes this year. She had one teacher that lasted a day. Um, in second grade, she had a beautiful teacher. In first grade, she had an amazing and kind teacher. And all of them have been lost except for um, Chloe, who's amazing and carrying that class. Um, unfortunately, it just doesn't work for my daughter. And I was just hoping that there would be some answer that maybe my rising first grader will have a consistent teacher through the eighth grade. And maybe my third grader could return in fourth grade, knowing that she would have a consistent teacher to carry her through eighth. Um, we were fortunate that when my eighth grader started, his class did receive a teacher that year that stuck with them from sixth through eighth grade. But before that, that class also had had issues with retaining their teacher before we attended the school. So it would be nice to know that there were some efforts made for retention or education or whatever the issues are that are causing these people to take their skills and abilities and love for our children to schools that better support them. Frank, do you want to jump into that? You bet. I can take that on right now. You know, um, there's a couple of things that are in the works that are going to provide stability for our staff. I feel really good about my role. I believe the board is very confident in what I can do. And so far I've had 
very good feedback from staff members that I'm heading in the right direction. So the stability of a leader is going to be at the top. The second, there is no doubt that teachers want to know that whatever issues have been in the past to cause people to leave can be resolved. And a big piece of that is going to be taken on in our uh, summer program or right after the school year with Peter and Miss Treadaway and um, Teresa, that that will be very helpful in getting us to contemplate what, where we are, where we were, and where we need to go. That's step two. Step three, I clearly see that our, we have not paid much attention to what health insurance companies have been doing to us and the increases that are taking money away from our budget because they can. I am going to be spending some time on trying to go to bid to get a better price on our health insurance and a better plan. That matters to teachers and families and staff and families. That is a really big deal. I have some experience in this in my past districts, and I've already started to reach out to the other four, four Waldorf schools in the state to see if they would join together with us because the number one reason a premium and a plan gets better and cheaper is if the employee numbers rise for the plan. So I'm trying to see if the other Waldorf scores, schools are interested in us all banding together for to choose one vendor. Um, uh, that may not have ever come out to you guys, but I'm telling you that is an issue for our staff members. It, it is ridiculous what they have to pay to put a child or a spouse on their insurance right now. Um, I don't know if Christy will nod to that, that it's just really too high, but I'm going to try and tackle that issue. And that should be a big reason for people to stay with the other two as well. I hope that answers that in detail. Thank you. Greg, I didn't say anything you disagree with there, correct? Correct. Correct. Okay. And um, yeah, it, 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 sorry, I was um, trying to type an answer to uh, Larry, uh, who swung by, missed our discussion of his question earlier. Um, did you mention the the new hires we have for next year too? Uh, I have not in this conversation. I have sent a uh, parent square to all seventh graders. As I know, that class has had several teachers this year, and we are really happy that we just hired a seventh grade teacher who is Waldorf trained, used to teach at the Flagstaff School, currently teaches in Hawaii, and she is moving back to Phoenix. Uh, she has accepted our position. She will start March 1st, and we hired her husband, um, and their name are the Kaisers. Um, Berber and Arn Kaiser, and they everything I understand, their background is tremendous. I spoke to their principal up in uh, Flagstaff, and before he would answer any of my questions, his comment was, uh, you need to know, if you don't hire these two people, you're a fool. <laughs> That's what he told me. And so we are happy to have offered them both contracts. They sent their contracts back to us on Friday. We believe Arn will be in the first grade. That has not been completely decided yet, as we may have some shifting going on. But we are hiring both teachers. Arn will be for next year, and Berber will start March 1st. And we're very happy about these two Waldorf-trained teachers. And they were trained, actually, in the Netherlands. And they grew up in Austria. So quite a background for them. I'm really excited to hear about the possibility of having a Waldorf trained teacher take my first grader because that I don't want to matters commit a lot to, to that me. yet. Kristen, don't hold me to that yet. Um, <laughs> we are still, there's a couple of spots that aren't resolved yet. And so uh, that has been an initial discussion, but is not fi formalized yet. 
I will keep my fingers crossed and I will wait anxiously for confirmation okay. on that. I would love to hear who our teacher is before the week before school starts this year. Uh, absolutely. We have every plan to make that decision before April 15th. That's, That's my wonderful. Because that also coincides with us being able to register where it would best fit our children. I understand. So thank you very much. Mm -hmm. All right, Th Kristen, thank you for your questions and for being here. Let's see. Um, or lower hand, okay. Uh, Peter, your hand has been raised for a while. Let's bring you back in. Peter, you're still on mute um, if you're here with us and ready to talk. All right. Uh, we'll come back to Peter. Um, let's go back to, uh, I think Barb Cunningham was the next person I saw. Barb? Hi. Oh, thank you so much. Um, I, this is really probably never a question that anyone has ever heard yet. And um, I think I'm assuming that our executive director might have some knowledge about this, but I'm curious about um, a legacy preference. <laughs> So, you know, I know that we have a preference, a sibling preference. I know we have a, a staff preference. Um, and I've also heard rumor, but can't confirm that there was also a grandparent preference. If you were employed there, that your grandchild would be eligible to be, um, to have a preference. My question is about a legacy preference um, in the the not too near future or no, I should say in the near future. I mean, a lot of our graduating first graduating class, mine, for instance, are already having children that are going to be eligible age to be um, in school. And I wasn't really sure um, if that's something that you would look at at a state level, or is that as a charter school, something you you decide what your preference is in, or could you point me in the right direction? I'm just curious um, if anyone has any information on that. It's, yes, um, there is a specific statute that covers what preferences you can give in charter school enrollment. Um, I can send that to you along with uh, a, a summary from the Arizona State Board of Charter Schools on preferential enrollment. Um, I don't think legacy is on there. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. Well, I appreciate that. Yeah. If you would send that to me, I would really appreciate it. And I had just two more small comments to make. One would be circling back to Danielle Ippolito's um, comment. Mm -hmm. And I totally understand, um, you know, Gregory, what you're speaking about, uh, wanting to get different um, backgrounds to be on the board. I, I think that what I would love to see is there be more balance in all areas of, of uh, what, what Danielle was speaking about. For instance, let's say on the board that perhaps 51% of the board spoke fluent Waldorf education I know that you said, well, you know, we've got five people on here and we've got a long history here. I thought might be a little bit different than fully steeped in Waldorf education. I don't mean any disrespect when I say that. I just think that um, I know that you're saying, well, you know, how are we going to decide that or not? Like, you know, do we have star bellied sneeches or, or not? <laughs> But and I understand that is really hard. But I but I think not in an elitist kind of way, but just your um, knowledge of um, 
understanding perhaps what am I trying to say? Just, just, I think that there is a difference, but at this very moment, I couldn't perhaps put it into words, but I think that there is, it would be nice to see that 51% of people are actually, have actually done, done a bit of studying into Waldorf education and all the facets of that. And maybe even Rudolf Steiner, that's, that's one thing. But then again, you know, maybe in your administration that, you have lots of um, different people that work in the administration building, perhaps hopefully 51% of those people would have a clear understanding of Waldorf education. And I, I guess, you know, the same thing that Danielle was speaking about, hoping that all of our teachers were fully Waldorf trained, that might not be real in a, in a public charter school, but that perhaps 51%, do you see where I'm going? Same thing with our parent body. We have, Parents that are there because it's, you know, just around the corner from them. Parents that are there because they love the animals. There also are parents that are there because they study Steiner or they, you know, really are turned on by Waldorf education. And hopefully that would be 51% of our parents. So I'm just saying that that's just my comment I wanted to make about what Danielle had to say. And, and it, to the point that Colleen made about the board applicants and going to an outside service, I, I would like to just remind us about when we had that wonderful woman, and I'm, I cannot remember who she was, but I know she interviewed with um, Danielle when Danielle came through, and she withdrew her application because she felt like she really needed sh that it, she personally felt like there was great value in coming out of our community to be on the board. So she withdrew her application. And I know Gregory that you said, I would be really sad if you do that. And I too felt the same way. I was like, my God, don't go. But, yeah. um, but you know, just from that point of her making that statement, I think we need to spend some time with that is all I have to say. And I'll, I'll give someone else a turn. Thank you for another turn, by the way. You're welcome, and, and thanks for making those points. You know, I, I hear what you're saying, um, and I think we're in general agreement um, that we want people to be as, you know, the highest caliber Waldorf education, history, fluency that we possibly can be. That's, I think, an aspirational goal. Um, and especially as a public charter, we certainly can't tell parents or potential parents, well, you don't <laughs> meet our Waldorf litmus test, so your student isn't eligible. That's just not something we get to do. But what we can do is we can you know, get back to doing parent education, which I know is something that you have been advocating for and, and others have been advocating for. Um, it, it's just, uh, and I think we're getting to a point where that's something we can start planning for now that we have put out the fires and we are in a growth mindset now. So I'm looking forward to that. All right, I, I'm gonna uh, bring in Adeline Carrera again. Um, she is the last person with a hand up and I think we'll make this the last of the evening. Hello. Hi, Adeline. Oh. Welcome back. Uh, I feel I'm on the spot being the last one. That's that's a major reward, I think. <laughs> um, so I have a few comments and possible concerns, questions might come in there, hopefully. Um, to bounce off of what Barb was saying, um, I also agree there should be a percentage in each of those three folds that have knowledge of Steiner's teachings and, and it, it doesn't necessarily have to be Waldorf education. They could just know about anthroposophy. They could know about biodynamic farming, um, how finances are um, dealt with and what Steiner believed. Um, and uh, what I want to question about that is what are our plans to bring more community education on Waldorf um, besides our little book club, which seems to be 
a tiny handful of people. Unfortunately, not, not enough people are showing interest. Um, I know that we once upon a time had a humble hive that brought in wonderful chances to have experiences firsthand with people in our within our community, um, within our own state, with our own town that had a Waldorf background. We had some uh, wonderful, um, a wonderful time with uh, Bobby Harshfield, our biodynamic farmer at the time, um, who gave a wonderful talk about the importance of the garden for the children and for parents as well, being part of that community and, and growing the garden. Um, and uh, so I'm just curious <laughs> if, if there are plans in the pike, down the pike for that. Um, and what would that look like? Cause I don't think it should just include parents. I think it should include beyond that. I, I want to see teachers, I want to see staff, I want to see board members at some of these gatherings, not just parents, because it's important that we're all together as a community. Well, let me start by saying I couldn't agree with you more. Um, I would love to see all of those things. I think the first thing we're going to be working on as far as bringing everybody together and educating them about what we're doing here is, is going to be this contemplation exercise. But then, you know, as we move into fall um, and, and the next school year, I think we would then be well positioned to do a lot of those, you know, community education events. Um, you know, but do we have any specific concrete plans at this moment? No, we don't. Uh, if you have speakers you'd like to hear from, if you have uh, you know, people that you know that you think would be great to hear from, let us know. Um, it's not that hard to schedule a webinar. <laughs> we have the we have the technology right. now, so we we can do this now. Even in the time of COVID, it's just we haven't done it. So, uh, you know, if you have concrete ideas, send them our way, and, and we'll see what we can do. Um, well, perhaps we can maybe reach out to Michelle Kratzer and bringing that back. I know the parent council was kind of the host, host, mm -hmm. hostess of that. Um, but, uh, you know, again, like I said, I don't want it to just be about a, the parents education. I want it to be the community's education. So having uh, Mr. Marito, you know, being part of that as well would be lovely to see him participate and other staff and faculty. Um, especially if they're new to our school. Uh, I, I just feel that the translation of Waldorf is not um, consistent. And so, you know, calling and I, you know, forgive me, Mr. Fran <laughs> Mr. Maurizio, but saying our school is a farm school or that we have a petting zoo just really it irks me to hear that that's what it's being explained as. And um you know, we once upon a time had a trained biodynamic farmer as a teacher to our students. Um, and we somehow felt that sh someone felt that she was not necessary anymore. And that really hurt our community. Um, if you can't tell, I'm very passionate about that, about her and about that garden. Um, so, um Forgive me if I'm choking up. Miss um, Carrera, please accept my apology. I meant no ill will with my one word descriptions. Yeah. I was just getting through a scenario of what I see as right. uh, strength of the campus. That's all. Yeah. And I am giving you the benefit of the doubt. I mean, you are, you've been kind of put in this place and you're learning probably alongside some of our little kindergarten first graders about what this curriculum is about and what, and also what our school has been through and what our school is learning um, and becoming. So I am giving you benefit of the doubt. And I appreciate your vigor and, and wanting to jump in and being so welcoming to everyone. And um, it, it's great to finally have a permanent person in that place. <laughs> Um, so that that helped me uh, in deciding to stay because um, I did have a foot out the door. 
I was getting pretty concerned that we couldn't keep someone in that position. Um, We're glad you're here. <laughs> thank you. Uh, I think my other one, it kind of ties in to what I'm, um, what I was talking about with the garden, but uh, can, and maybe it's a, a, a board member question. Can our budget support the stipend that the LDC members are receiving for participating in that group? Yes, is the short answer. Um, and it has supported it over the last two years. Um, we, we are currently looking at our budget right now and we're looking at all parts of it. Um, but, you know, that said, we don't, anticipate that that's going to change right now, uh, absent some kind of extenuating circumstance. Um, you know, I my hope is that with more students and uh, a more energized community and a successful contemplation exercise, uh, the funding problems we've had in the past are gonna be farther and farther in the rear view mirror. Right. So let me, let me also say that the members of the LDC, um, Christy Martin included, since she's here with us, uh, on a Saturday afternoon for two hours, <laughs> uh, the people are putting in heroic effort on behalf of the school. And to, you know, if, if there's, yeah, everybody wants to get paid more, um, but these people are truly going the extra mile um, and, and really trying to do the very, you know, their level best to help the school. And I, I think it's a fair, uh, you know, balance that we made between all the extra work that they're putting in and getting uh, an extra stipend. Right. Correct. And to that, um, if you rounded up the amount that they each receive a year, that would pay for a dynamic farmer, a teacher, um, that could bring that to our classroom. So that's why I question that because we lost that person when we could have dissolved the LDC for a time being until those funds were back again. Yeah, I, I hear what you're saying. I think that just raises, it, that, then the question is, okay, well, who's going to do the work that the LDC was doing? Are we just going to expect them to do the same thing, but not compensate them for it? Y you know, it, it's, right. everything's well, a compromise and it's not a, I, I hear what you're saying. It's just, it's not a, it, it's not an easy answer. Right. But that's where the teachers come together the faculty comes together and decides, okay, we're all going to work on this as a team. We're all going to be mentors for each other. K through second grade is a little group together. Second, you know what I mean? Breaking up the grades and having them each be their own little realm of, of working through the pedagogy, working through the curriculum and, you know, and figuring out how to, to, align the state standards with the Waldorf curriculum. Um, and I say this, Gregory, so you have a better understanding. I was once on a faculty at a public Waldorf school and was able to do that. And we didn't have an LBC. We didn't have an overhead above the faculty. It was, we worked together as a team. We were, you know, we were one instead of having a, a group of individuals who oversaw in some way, like a, you know, a supervisor of some sorts be, besides what the executive director is for. Yeah. I mean, certainly there are other models and other models that are very successful. This is the one we've chosen for the time being and it, shifting course entirely um, when it affects people's bottom line it is very tough to do. Uh it's it's an institutional question. I think you raise good points, and I think they're ones that we should all take into consideration. Um, but is it something that's going to change tomorrow? Probably not. I think you 
probably heard a lot today about how excited we all are about bringing sustainability back to the campus and really uh, showcasing the garden. And I certainly hope that we can bring back the, the bio, biodynamic farming. <clears throat> but are we there yet today? You know, I think we just need more time. We're still getting our house in order. Yes, and I know that the contemplation will definitely help in that. So yeah. I definitely appreciate all the efforts that are being made to ensure that that, that happens. Um, thank you, Peter, for, I don't know if you're being paid or if you're volunteering, but I sincerely appreciate yours and Joan's uh, time and effort in helping our new executive director uh, facilitate this for our community. Um, thank you so much. And, and thanks for being here and sorry to cut this short. I'm sure we could go on for another sure. couple hours, <laughs> Thank um, you. but uh, we're already a half an hour over time. <laughs> uh, so thanks everyone for being here. Really appreciate it. Special thanks to uh, Christy, uh, one of our dedicated teachers for being here on Saturday afternoon. Um, Frank, thanks so much for being here too. I, I know you have, a million ideas you're trying Mama. to act on and appreciate you being here. And Danielle, Mama. and no, it's always busy. So thanks for being here. Thank you, everybody. Thank All right. You. Bye. Good night. Bye. Good night. Thank you.